Let's pray together. Father God, we indeed give you glory. You are our most gracious God and King. And we pray today that as we turn our attention to your Son, the one who does your works, the one who you have commissioned to do certain things, the one who deserves honor and to be marveled at, we pray indeed that you would continue to help us to know him, to believe him, to find our hope and our future in him, to shape our affections toward him, we pray. Amen. A few weeks ago, the memorial service was held for George Herbert Walker Bush, the 41st president of the United States. And at his funeral, his son, George Walker Bush, delivered a eulogy about his dad. A president eulogizing a president. A father eulogizing, a son eulogizing his father. (laughs) And it wasn't lost on anyone who saw that or have seen the life of the Bush family over the last number of years that this son looks an awful lot like his father. (laughs) And he does what his father did. Of course, it's not uncommon for sons to do what their fathers do. Many of you have followed your father into the family business or maybe at least into the same field or industry. And this happens for a variety of reasons and it begins at a very young age. Patrick Mahomes was a major league pitcher for a number of teams, including the Minnesota Twins. And his son, Patrick Mahomes, is the star quarterback for the Kansas City Chiefs. Not the same sport, but both professional athletes, like father, like son. (laughs) Just a couple weeks ago, my son entered our bedroom early in the morning. He crawled up on top of me and grabbed my face with his two hands and pulled me in real tight to deliver his very first words of the day. Dad, when I grow up, I'm going to be a pastor just like you. (laughs) A son wanting to do what his father does. George W. Bush following the steps of George H. W. Bush and against all odds ascends all the way to the presidency of the United States of America. A son doing what his father does. It's not uncommon for sons to do what their fathers do. Whether it's because of genetics or mimicking or admiration or their relationship Or maybe it's just something in their nature. Many sons will follow their fathers. And so when we turn our attention to Jesus, the Son of God, it's not surprising completely to hear him say that he does what the Father does. Of course, there are some similarities with this earthly comparison between fathers and fathers and sons. And of course, there are some vast differences in that relationship of father and son compared to our earthly relationships. But what we see is that Jesus does what the father does because of their relationship, because of the mirroring that happens, and because their essence is of the same nature. And this is what he shows us in John chapter 5. So I want to ask you to turn your Bible with me to John chapter 5. And this morning we pick up in the story of Jesus revealing himself starting in verse 18. You might remember last week that we talked about how Jesus healed a lame man at the pool of Bethesda. He did so on the Sabbath. The Pharisees challenged the man for carrying his mat on the Sabbath and for Jesus for healing on the Sabbath. And the end of that section... Jesus answers these Pharisees who are really questioning who is this guy and what is he doing. Verse 17 says, Jesus answered them, my father is working until now 
and I am working. Starting at verse 18. This was why the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him. Because not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal to God. So Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, the son can do nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees the father doing. For whatever the father does, the son does likewise. For the father loves the son and shows him all that he himself is doing. And greater works than these he will show him, so that you may marvel. For as the father raises the dead and gives them life, so also the son gives life to whom he will. The father judges no one, but has given all judgments to the son, that all may honor the son just as they honor the father. Whoever does not honor the son does not honor the father who sent him. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. Truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming and is now here when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself. And he has given him authority to execute judgment because he is the Son of Man. Do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come out. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. Throughout the Gospel of John, Jesus has been revealing who he is. And as he has encountered many people, they are asking the question, who is this guy? <laughs> as he speaks authoritatively, as he heals people, as he sees through the layers of the human psyche into the depths of the very soul, he is revealing himself to be God. And some people are catching on, including the religious leaders of the day. And as a result, they were trying to kill him. It says in verse 18, we read it just a moment ago, that Jesus was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. They were hearing what he was saying, and they did not like it. And in fact, coming off this healing at the pool of Bethesda, Jesus describes for them a little bit more why and how this relationship between the Father and the Son works. And he says that the great works of the Son follow the great works of the Father. Look with me at verse 19 in the beginning of 20. Jesus said to them, Truly I say to you that the Son can do nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees his Father doing. For whatever the Father does, that the Son does likewise. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all that he himself is doing. Now it's not surprising to anybody that God can do incredible things. But it is surprising to people that this person, Jesus, is doing incredible things. And so he bridges the gap. To be God means you can do things that mere mortals cannot do. The physical laws of nature don't apply to God. The boundaries of time aren't boundaries of God. The limits that we have in our perception of the spiritual realm and or the physical realm, those aren't limitations for God. And so as Jesus comes, we see the state of the world expressed in John chapter 1, verse 18. It says, no one has ever seen God. 
the only God, who is at the Father's side, he has made him known. No one has seen God. But God the Son, who's at his side, is making him known. So we see that Jesus comes and he performs miracle after miracle as he turns water into wine, as he heals the lame man at Bethesda and many others. We see that he has insight into the spiritual dynamics of people as he rebukes the Pharisees and challenges Nicodemus and pursues the woman at the well. We see that many are beginning to believe and to recognize that he is God. As a whole village at Sychar come to proclaim that he is the savior of the world. How could Jesus do all of these things? Because he does what the father does. The father shows him everything he is doing. And he too engages in the work. Can you imagine the interaction between the father and the son? as the Father continually reveals everything that he is doing all at the same time, that one little phrase is enough for your imagination to run wild. What must it be like in this father-son relationship? This is what some people call functional subordination of Jesus the Son, to the Father. They are co-equal in their eternality, in their value, in their holiness, and so much more. But they have different roles from each other, and they perform those roles, Father and Son, in this harmonious internal structure of unity and authority (laughs) that functions in love. So it says... God the Father, out of his eternal love for the Son, displays his power to him that he might do the same works himself. The Father initiates and sends and commands and commissions and grants. The Son responds and obeys and performs his Father's will. And as we'll see in a moment, even has a unique authority that the Father has given him. This relationship of father to son and how Jesus and the father function together has a number of implications, but two come to mind immediately. The first is that this is how Jesus makes the father known throughout his life. No one has ever seen God, but the only God who is at his side makes him known. How? Through his obedience to the Father and the unity in doing the works of the Father, show people who the Father is. If you want to know what God is like, look to Jesus. And in fact, Jesus tells those who question this relationship of father to son, whoever does not honor the son does not honor the father. That's one implication. Secondly, we understand that knowing the fact that God is revealing himself to the world when he didn't have to, And that God's revelation to the world is one of the greatest blessings that humanity can experience. God didn't have to reveal himself to us, yet he chose to do so anyway. And in doing so, we are tremendously blessed. And even though his love for us in doing so is profound in its nature... This relationship between the Father and the Son shows us that his revelation does not chiefly depend on his love for us. God's self-revealing to the world chiefly depends on his love for his Son. 
and for the son's love for the father. Why is that important? It's important because we so often are tempted to think that we are the center of the universe. And that God owes us something. And if he doesn't give us what we perceive to owe us, then maybe he doesn't truly love us. God, fix my situation. God, meet my standards. God, give me the desires of my life. But here's the core reality. You aren't at the center of God's universe. God is at the center of God's universe. He values what is most valuable, namely himself. And we see in this perfectly expressed love between the members of the Trinity that happens for all of eternity. And what's so amazing then is that even though that we aren't at the center of God's universe, that he chooses to love us anyway. (laughs) And this makes his love all the more profound. And it's what we celebrate at Christmas. The incarnation of Jesus, God with us. Emmanuel. And that is rooted chiefly in the love between the Father and the Son, and it's applied to you. (laughs) And so Jesus is showing the works of his Father. But then he indicates that greater works are coming. Look at it with me at verses 20 through 24. He says that the Father loves the Son and shows him all that he's doing. And greater works than these will he show him so that you may marvel. For as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, so also the Son gives life to whom he will. The Father judges no one, but has given all judgments to the Son, that all may honor the Son just as they honor the Father. Whoever does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. So what are the greater things? What is greater than changing the material substance of water to wine? (laughs) What is greater than exercising the sheer word of power that causes somebody who has been lame for 38 years to stand up and walk? What is greater than looking into the to a person's life past the layers of their difficulty into the very depths of their heart and their soul? What is greater than that? Raising people to life. (laughs) And judgment. There are two greater things that Jesus talks about here. And they are given so that you may marvel at him. (laughs) First, he talks about raising to life. And here's a couple of observations. Verse 21 The son gives life to whom he will. And by life here, we are talking in both realms of spiritual life and physical resurrection, which we'll talk about in a minute. He does this just like the father does. Verse 24, whoever hears and believes has eternal life. And verse 29, those who've done good will attain the resurrection of life. So there's a sense in which hearing and believing in the words of the Son, leads to this life. That life is displayed in the doing of good, which happens or is recognized fully at the resurrection. I want to stop for a minute and camp on the second of those observations because it's very important to understand. And if you get it, I think it will shift the way you think about what's happening to you even right now. Jesus says in verse 24 that upon hearing and believing... The person has or possesses eternal life. Present tense, 
You have it right now. It's so often the case that when we think about our life and the afterlife, we think about the struggle that we go through in this life, that we believe in him. If we believe in him, he'll forgive us of our sins. And if he forgives us for our sins, and if we persevere to the end, then at the end, then we will be given eternal life, that it will come to us. Not so. Eternal life has already begun for the believer in the Lord Jesus. Salvation and its benefits transfer from the future into the present based simply on the life-giving power of Jesus. The wrath of God will not be applied to you. The fear of physical death is supplanted. The penalty for your sins is removed immediately, forever. And the benefits of God are applied to you right now upon belief. Now think about that for a moment. Because so many of us thought that eternal life was something that was coming. In fact, you can start living eternal life right now. And that comes by belief in Jesus. This is the language that is used throughout the New Testament, but it's so hard for us to grasp. Colossians chapter 1 uses this type of language. Verse 13 and 14, he has delivered us from the domain of darkness into, and transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Not he will deliver us and he will transfer us. He has delivered us and has transferred us from one kingdom to another the benefits are possessed immediately upon belief because the work is already done. And then eternal life begins in the present. That's the power of the glorious Son of God. He is the life giver. And we marvel at him. And so I know what some of you are thinking. You are thinking, wow, I never really thought about that before. I never thought about the fact that eternal life actually begins in this life. Why, then, is life so hard? Why do I still struggle with sin? And why is physical death a reality that we all have to contend with? If eternal life begins right now. Well, because even for those who are already living in eternal life, we are not yet living it out to the full. Think of it this way. Think of any number of things in this life that you affix together that requires you to overlap them. Some of you are wrapping Christmas presents during this time of year. And you know that when you turn the box over and you get to the back side that you're very frustrated if the wrapping paper comes short and you know that it's almost never the case that the two ends actually just abut together in perfect synergy, that almost always the paper will overlap on the back. Think of the fabric of a garment that needs to be mended. Think of the garland on your banister that as you string it along, that one stream of the garland comes to an end, and you overlap a couple of feet so that it holds together so that there is a continuous appearance so that there is no gap in the coverage. The material overlaps. And at that place, both the old and the new material are there. Eventually, the old will run out <laughs> completely and the new will take over completely. But in the overlap, both realities are present. Friends, so it is with the Christian who has eternal life and who is living eternal life right now but overlaps with the difficulty of a sinful world. If you're a Christian, you're living in the overlap right now of both realities. But there will come a time when the old will run out and the new will take over 
completely. If you think about your life in that way, there are so many perspective-changing realities found there. And here's just two off the top of my head. Number one, if you think of your life as living out eternal life right now, number one, you have a profound confidence in God. That no matter what is happening before you, physically or spiritually, that this eternal life is something that is truly eternal. That he will not revoke his hand upon you or leave you by the wayside. And secondly, it gives you great hope. It gives you hope that Again, no matter what happens in the day, that there is a day when more complete and full and glorious eternal life, the greatest expression of the taste that you have right now will come to pass. And it causes us to marvel at the Lord Jesus. That is a great, great thing. The second greater thing that Jesus mentions here is judgment. We don't think about that often as a great thing. But when you see it for what it truly is, it will cause you to marvel. Verses 21 and 22 give this unequal parallelism. Both the Father and the Son give life, but the Father deems it that the Son should exercise judgment. He's the only one to do so. Verse 25 and on indicates that this happens after he raises the dead with his voice, and he appoints some people to life and others to condemnation. So that same voice that calls creation into being is the one who speaks his words to us and penetrates our hearts. Just by the words of Jesus, he displays the most incredible love or the most piercing insight into our thoughts, into our motives, into our actions. And by believing in his word, the words that come out of his mouth and that are written on the page before us, men and women and boys and girls for centuries across the globe in different countries and different cultures have yielded their hearts and received grace upon grace. His word is powerful. Powerful enough to call the dead people of centuries of existence from their graves to a day of judgment. Every one of us will be there. And there are three reasons listed here that Jesus will exercise judgment. There are many more reasons beyond this, the chief one, namely that he'll be upholding God's holiness and purity forever. But the three reasons listed here, verse 23, so that all may honor him like they honor the Father. The second reason in verse 26 is that he has life in himself, just like the Father has life in himself. That Jesus, this means that he is self-existent. He's eternal in his ways. No one gave him life. He's always had life. And as one who's always had life, he has the authority to exercise the giving of life and the rendering of judgment. And verse 27, the third reason is that he is the long foretold son of man who is prophesied about to exercise the will of God. Consider with me Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 and on. Hundreds of years before Jesus, the vision comes to the prophet about this son of man. It says, I saw in the night visions and behold with a cloud of heaven, there came one like a son of man. And he came to the ancient of days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples and nations and language should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. And so Jesus, the Son of Man who has come, is given a kingdom and glory which includes complete dominion, something that only God has, and then he comes and resides among humankind to show them the Father, the Ancient of Days, 
And in showing them the Ancient of Days, through his works and his words, evaluating their response of belief or unbelief. And this gives him the unique qualification to judge. There will be no miscalculations, no impure agenda, only the righteousness of a holy God who exercised dominion over all could do this. And that's what Jesus does. And so what is Jesus showing about himself? There's a lot of questions about who this guy is as he goes from place to place and does different things. Jesus is showing that the glorious son of God is, has done, is doing, and will do the all that the Father has appointed him in the giving of life and the judgment of condemnation because he is God. He's God. Who can do the things that he has done? Who can do the things that God is appointing him to do? Only God. You know, maybe my son will become a pastor someday. Or maybe not. He's like me. But not completely like me. Maybe Patrick Mahomes' son will be a professional athlete. Like his grandfather and his father before him. Maybe he'll be like them but not completely like them. Maybe your son will pursue your career someday. Or maybe not. He's a lot like you, but he'll still choose his own path because he's not completely like you. Not so with Jesus. He always does the will of the Father, because he shares his divine, eternal essence. The glorious Son of God has done, is doing, and will do all that the Father has appointed for him in the giving of life and the rendering of judgment. Why? Because he's God. Jesus is God. He does the works of God because he is God. He has seen Things that only God can see. He is not limited in any way by his time here on earth. He wasn't eternally bound because of his humanity. He is God and he came among us. And so I hope you enjoy him. I hope that you listen to his words and believe them. I hope that you take hold of the eternal life that you can start living right now because he loves you. Because he wants to forgive you. And I hope that you wrestle and struggle and pursue him to your final days when this eternal life is made complete and the overlap is over. It says in verse 20, Jesus says that greater works than these he will show him so that you may marvel. I don't know what causes you to marvel. Something that is so awe-inspiring that you just sit back and watch and no words can ever adequately express the majestic nature of what is happening before your very eyes. This Christmas, I hope that you're able to ponder these things and marvel. To marvel at a baby being born. To marvel at the works that he has done and the words that he has said. To marvel at the life that he gives 
and to marvel at the thought of the judgment that will come. In short, to marvel at the power of God. The word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory. Glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Let us pray. Father, we want to marvel at your Son because he does marvelous things. Peel back the layers of our pride, of our jadedness, of our apathy, to see him afresh as God with us.